I mean, I must have been the only guy not there. <laughs> I think that that may be the truth. Of it. I mean, of all the people I've talked to over the years, uh, I don't know too many people in the area that weren't there. <laughs> well, you're looking at one right here. I feel like I missed out. Well, all right, let's get... <laughs> <laughs> this is David Clyde, and I'm very honored today to be on the Tony Pruitt Show, and I hope we don't run anybody off. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tony Pruitt Show. And this week, we have a very special guest. If you are a Texas Ranger fan, you're going to love our guest today. He is definitely a Texas Ranger legend. He was the number one pick in the 1973 draft. He played five seasons with the Texas Rangers and briefly with the Cleveland Indians for a few years. Unfortunately, his career was cut short due to arm and shoulder injuries. He had an amazing high school he was an amazing high school standout, sorry, at Westchester High School. He, in fact, he was the number one player in the country at that time. And believe it or not, he went straight into the pros right out, right out of high school, which is amazing. Please welcome to the show, Mr. David Clyde. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on. Before we get started, I got to tell you, a mutual friend of ours, Stan Huff, Says to tell you, hello, I understand y'all played together with the Astros. We did play together uh, for a little bit in the Astros organization. So Stan's a longtime friend and good people. He is a good guy. He's a nut, though. Well, those of us that are on the outside of a padded cell are the ones, I think, that are crazy. I think if you take life a little bit too seriously, it kind of <laughs> takes, takes you by the tail and doesn't let go. Absolutely. I wish my dad were still living today to watch this interview because he was a huge fan of yours. And I grew up hearing all the stories. I was 11 years old when you made your debut. I hear it was electrifying. I, I, uh, I've just I've been I've told been told the story many times by him. So I can't wait to do this interview. I heard Tom Grease say one time that you were better than Roger Clemens. In fact, Roger Clemens at that time couldn't hold your jock strap. How do you feel about him saying that? <laughs> well, I mean, what, what can you say? I mean, to be compared to one of the, you know, one of the great pitchers of the game, it's uh, quite an honor. So, uh, absolutely. And the experts say if they had handled you differently, you could have been a three hundred game winner. I mean, who knows? You were that good. I, I've been I've been telling people that you were coming on this show this week, and I'm amazed at how many people told me that they were at your debut. Um, in 73, I guess it was. I mean, I must have been the only guy not there. <laughs> I think that, that may be the truth. I mean, of all the people I've talked to over the years, uh, I don't know too many people in the area that weren't there. <laughs> well, you're looking at one right here. I feel like I missed out. Well, all right, let's get... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take you back way back in time. So let's, let's pick your memory a little bit. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, take me back to the day when you signed with the Rangers. Do you remember that day? I heard it was a huge media frenzy at the time. Uh, what do you remember about that day? The actual signing day was done in very, very private. There was no press around on the actual signing day. I, I think the day in, that you're referring to was the day of the draft when they actually drafted me. And uh, it was pretty much a circus that day. I mean, there were quite a few trucks lined up outside the house uh, with video feeds going everywhere. So, uh, I bet it was. I know you've been asked this a million times, but I got to ask you do you ever look back and feel like you were robbed of your career the way that Rangers handled you and not putting you in the minors? I don't know. I mean, that, that, that that's hard to say. Yes, they, they probably should have handled it a lot differently. Um, the Rangers were in financial straits at that time. Uh, everything was kind of a perfect storm at that time. And so the original right. plan, the original plan, uh, which was unbeknownst to me at the time, was uh, Whitey Herzog, who was the manager of the Rangers at the time, had said, you know, we're going to let him have one or two starts, I guess, put some money in the bank and then send him to the instructional league and let him start learning his trade. So, uh, you know, the big leagues is, it, it, it's a whole different game at that point. Um, it's not that physically it's that much difference. It, it, it's the entire mental side of the game. I mean, in, instead of playing just a couple of times a week, you're playing every night, you're traveling, I mean, there's just, there, there's so many things that go into it that are not really 
very conducive to a young player at that time. Sure. I mean, you're a build as the next Sandy Koufax. I can't imagine the kind of stress that you were under. You know, to be honest about it, that time, I really, you know, I can't say that I felt it. Uh, I think the biggest pressure I felt was from myself. Um, the big thing that would have helped had I probably been sent to the minor leagues was understanding that I do belong. Uh, I felt, you know, having jumped straight from high school to the big leagues, that my talent had to make such a huge jump. And in, the, in that respect, I, I actually put more pressure on myself to be better than I actually was, which in turn was actually detrimental to me performing at my best. Right. Sure. Let's go back to your opening day. Um, when you first joined the Rangers, you're 18. Do you remember what it felt like to be in the locker room at that time, fixing to go out before 35,000 plus fans? Do you recall that? Were you just scared out of your wits or were you just calm and collected? I, you know, it was a very, very long day. The anticipation, uh, you know, of 7.30 that night had been building in, for, in me for my entire life. I mean, here I was getting ready to live my dream. And so uh, that was a very, very long afternoon. Um, it was kind of lonely in the clubhouse. You know, everybody's out on the field, uh, you know, with batting practice and, and everything early. Um, it, 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 you know, just the anticipation of the moment, it, it kind of like Christmas morning. It seems like it never gets there. Uh, I can only imagine. So on your debut, your first inning, do you remember the first inning? You walked the first two batters, and I believe you struck out the side. Do you recall that inning and how I the, do. you do? I do. Um, you know, Jerry Terrell let off. Uh, my catcher, Kenny Suarez, told me that I really didn't walk anybody in that first inning, I, you know, I, that I did throw some very, very good pitches. But, you know, being a young kid, uh, kind of in a situation, had, you know, a lot of people not feeling I had earned the right to be there. Uh, it's kind of the the rite of passage that umpires are going to squeeze you a little bit just to test you and see how you are. And so, right. uh, you know, I walked the first two guys and all of a sudden thoughts of the previous year, uh, uh, my junior year in high school of pitching in the state semifinals in Austin in a game against uh, Bel Air out of Houston uh, that if you believed all the hype of the press should still be going on today, nothing, nothing, because they had a very good pitcher by the name of Jim Gideon, who went on to Texas and helped them win a World Series. He was drafted by the Rangers, pitched a little bit in the big leagues with the Rangers. Uh, but neither one of us made it to the fifth inning. So, uh, you know, I was I was pretty hyped up for that game and wasn't able to get the ball down into the strike zone. And Bel Air was very patient. So those memories flashed back pretty quick. After walking the first two, I said, you know, in my mind, I'm here in, in the biggest moment of my life, and I'm about yeah. ready to fall flat on my face. Right. But you got the win. I did get the win. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, we threw a couple of runners out that tried to steal. Uh, fortunately, the home run I gave up in the second inning, uh, I believe only had one man on base. And so uh, that's that's the bane of a pitcher is uh, you, you really don't want to lock up, walk a lot of people because with one swing of the bat, you start putting crooked numbers on the scoreboard. So uh, sure. Uh, right. But yes, I was very fortunate. Uh, uh, Bill Gogoliski came in and pitched four innings in relief to get the save. And like I said, the, I was just very fortunate to survive. You know, your opening debut was the first sellout the Rangers ever had. It's, it, that's amazing. I mean, do you remember the roar of the crowd? You know, when you're – I can't say I don't remember it, but you really don't get caught up so much in the moment. Uh, the biggest thing I remember about – one of the biggest things I remember about that night was the circus that was going on on the field prior to the game. I mean, uh, they had all the animals over from Six Flags of Texas. They had, you know – well, it was literally a, a three ring circus out there. And, and then on top of that, they delayed the game 15 minutes because of a massive traffic jam outside the ballpark. So I don't know, right. you know, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of first that night, I don't know that a major league baseball <laughs> game's ever been delayed because of a traffic jam. <laughs> that, that's unbelievable. 
So as an 18 year old, when you joined the team, did, how did the teammates, did they accept you with open arms? Were they standoffish? Did they, how did they, how did you handle that situation? I, you know, here I am an 18 year old and the next youngest guy on the team is probably 24, 25 years old. Right. It's a, that's a difficult situation for everybody. Uh, Absolutely. You know, uh, some of the old time, you know, I can't say that I felt any animosity or anything from anybody, but then again, I'm sure there was some there for get from guys that had spent, you know, several years in the minor leagues. Uh, the biggest thing is, is I didn't ask to be in that situation. I mean, sure. that was a situation that the Rangers offered me. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the years that we demanded to go to the big leagues. Well, we didn't demand, we didn't demand anything outside of one thing. And that is we wanted a major league contract. Um, by virtue of being on, getting a major league contract, they had to put you on the 40 man active roster to give you that, 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 that doesn't mean you go to the big leagues. It just means that you're on the 40 man roster and that anytime they send you to the minor leagues, they have to use an option. I was advised of asking for this by several former players that lived in the Houston area that we had talked to earlier that year prior to the draft. And they advised us to, you know, don't get so much tied up in the amount of money you get, get, you, you want to be more tied up into the type of contract that you sign. Uh, and, and we wanted that contract because we wanted the Rangers to have to have made a decision on my career by the time I was 21 or 22 years old. So you know, had I not gone to the big leagues, immediately I would have used one of those options being sent out. And therefore, if I didn't make the big leagues again in 74, they would have used another option. And then, and if they, once they use the third option, you're frozen at the minor league level. And in order to get back to the big leagues, you have to clear waivers to get back to the big leagues. In other words, you're offered to all the other major league teams at a, at a very reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And also, you become eligible, and I don't even know if they still have this anymore, the Rule 5 draft that follows the followings uh, in January of every year, where if you're not on the 40-man protected roster, then other major league ball clubs can once again pick you up for a reasonable price. And when they do that, if you, you, if you are picked up through the Rule 5 draft, you have to be placed on the other team's major league roster and kept at, a, at the big league level for that following year. Uh, otherwise you're returned back to your original ball club. Be it fair or unfair. Many people say that you're the one that saved Texas Ranger baseball because attendance were so bad. The Rangers were so bad. And there's no question that when you pitch, you, you put butts in the seats. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's no, a big the, deal. The way you're, you're really kind of the first person in all the years that's kind of worded that question properly. Oh, or thank you. Statement <laughs> properly. You know, everybody over the years says I saved the franchise. Uh, there's never been a major league franchise in the entire hundred and some odd years of baseball that's actually folded. They have packed up and moved. I mean, the Milwaukee Braves moved to Atlanta. Right. Uh, the Seattle pilots, I think became the next Milwaukee brewers, uh, you know, the Montreal expos are now the Washington senators or well, the original Minnesota twins or Minneapolis team, uh, moved to Washington many, many years ago, uh, prior to the, prior to what, what the nationals, um, I will say that I did help keep the Rangers in Texas. Absolutely. Uh, I was able to prove to people that Bob Short at that time was in financial straits, as I said, and wanted to sell, needed to sell the ball club. I'm not going to say he wanted to sell the ball club, but needed to sell the ball club. It proved to people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, local investors um, with the finances to buy a ball club, that we could compete with the Dallas Cowboys, which was at that time America's team, uh, mm -hmm. that we could compete with them financially and fan wise. And so, you know, Bob was able to sell the, uh, the team to Brad Corbett and, you know, look at where they're at today. Absolutely. Did you as an 18 year old though, know how important your presence made or 
were you just oblivious to it? I was oblivious to it. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I didn't, I, growing up, I had, I mean, having gone to school here in Houston at that time, the Astros were a National League team, so we didn't get a whole lot of American League press coverage down here. I, I didn't have any idea who the Texas Rangers were. So do you feel they did use you as a promotional gimmick, so to speak? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a business, and people have sure. to understand that, and I understand that. Um, it's just a shame that it wasn't handled a little differently, uh, looking at more of a long-term investment instead of a short, quick return. Sure. After you were drafted, do you remember when you found out you were not going to go to the minors, you were going to stay in the bigs, or, or when did they when did they tell you that? They really couldn't be out outside of the draft. And I forget what day of the month. It, it's the first week in March, not March, excuse me, June. And so they're outside of them contacting me and telling me they had picked me number one. They were not really allowed to be in contact with me until after the state baseball tournament was over with. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. So um, we really weren't in contact with them until the follow the week after the, the tournament when Bob Short and Joe Burke flew to Houston and negotiations lasted about an hour and a half. And at that point is when they told me, you know, you're going straight to the big leagues. Wow. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Tell them, no, that's the wrong thing to do. You know, sure. I mean, a 15 year old kid with an opportunity of living his dream. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, <laughs> things were a lot different 50 years ago. So um, you know, you, you couldn't necessarily tell a ball club back then not to draft you like you can today. You know, there, there's a lot of pre-draft positioning that goes on nowadays with, uh, you know, especially with the amount of money that they're throwing out at these young men. Uh, they don't want to waste a very high round draft pick on someone that is not going to sign with them. And so there's a lot of pre-draft negotiations that go on that today, you know, 50 years ago didn't happen. And, uh, you know, had I, you know, had I told the Rangers not to draft me, uh, not that I would have not, you know, not knowing everything that was going to happen, but had I told them that I'd have been blackballed, I, I wouldn't have been picked yeah. or sure. if I had been picked, it would have been, you know, very low. Right. Well, you had a very successful high school career. I believe you were 18, you know, I think you had five no hitters. Some reports I've read said you had ten. I don't know. You set fourteen records that still hold today. A lot of them. Were you disappointed by being drafted by the Rangers, or did, were you happy, or because you're from Texas? And was that a good thing for you, or did you just not care? At that time, I didn't care. I mean, I, I just wanted to play. I mean, it's just like today, like like to, you know, in today's market, you have, and we'll just talk about pitchers. Uh, every major league team has four minor league teams with a minimum of 10 pitchers on each roster. Okay. So each team's got 40 pitchers in their minor league system. that are all trying to take one of those 10 positions in the big leagues away from the guys that are already there. Sure. Well, you know, and we'll talk about the Astros right now. I mean, a very, very successful uh, organization over the last 10, 15 years, uh, you know, who wouldn't want to play for the Astros, but yet at the same time, we have 40 guys in the minor leagues making basically not much better than minimum wage that I promise you would be more than happy to play in the big leagues for the Florida Marlins or any of the teams that are on the bottom of the, of the heap right now, because the minimum salary in the big leagues is, appro is approaching $800,000. Wow. And, you know, uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the benefits of playing in the big leagues, you start acquiring service time you towards your pension and everything. Uh, if you do blossom, endorsements and everything. So, I mean, those are all things that are, you know, like I said, I, even if you're in the Astros organization, they would be more than happy to play in the big leagues for anybody else. Sure, absolutely. Well, when you signed with the Rangers, it's reported you got a huge signing bonus of 125000 Other reports I've read say it wasn't that much. But nonetheless, that's a lot of money for an 18-year-old at that time in 73. 
Now I'm going to pick your brain. Do you remember one of the first big purchases that you made? Did you go out and buy a house or car? Did you go out to dinner that night? I mean, what, what did you rem remember what you did when you got that money? Well, first off, I wanted to do something for my parents, but they refused. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I tried to tell my mama, you know, y'all have done so much for me, but they absolutely vehemently refused, almost to the point of they'd disown me if I did anything for oh, them. Right. Um, but as far as the big purchases, uh, I made two purchases in 73. Um, one of them was a car. Right. Uh, uh, and basically that, you know, I, d I could have paid cash for it at the time. I mean, I bought an, uh, an electric 225, Buick Electra 225, which is like a Cadillac. Right. Uh, that car would probably go for close, to, probably over $100,000 today. Um <laughs> $6,700. Wow. <laughs> Times have changed, haven't they? But, yeah, well, yes, they have. <laughs> like, but, but my dad, you know, was advising me and he said, you need to start establishing some credit. So, so we bought it, you know, on, on a credit plan. And then in December of that year, I bought a townhouse in Fort Worth. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, that was, that was another credit deal. I was, <laughs> uh, you have to excuse my dog. She's being a no, you're right now. So <laughs> now <laughs> you're, She's fine. Um, but those were the two main big purchases I made. So, Good deal. After you joined the Rangers, do you remember bonding with anybody in particular? Did you, somebody Not you hung really. out with? No? Um, kind of, you know, I, I thought maybe, you know, a, a, an older player had, had maybe taken me under his wing. But really, in all honesty, you know, I would – would have hoped he had taken me under his wing, but I really don't know if some of these guys were out maybe to take advantage of me or whatever. I would hope it was more trying to make me feel part of the team than the latter. But as far as really bonding with anybody on that ball club, there were, you know, not really. You were a loner. Pretty much. I mean, you know, pretty much. I mean, like I said, I was 18 years old. I mean, you know, when you're 24, 25, who wants to hang with a snot nosed 18 year old? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, as you get older, six, seven years in age is not that big a deal, but at that point, that, that's a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. But being 18 year old, having all the money, being a celebrity status, being in the Metroplex, you had to have had some kind of nightlife as an 18 year old. I know I would. Well, I'm not going to say I didn't. I mean, <laughs> wasn't maybe what everybody might think it was, but you know, it, 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 it's, it kind of goes with the territory a little bit. I mean, I'm not I'm sure it does excuses for any of it, but no, no. You, you've always got a lot of demands on your time. People want a piece of you and uh, you know, it, it's difficult to, to, you know, try to maintain some sort of normal life. Absolutely. Tell me about the legendary Whitey Herzog and your relationship with him. And what kind of guy is he? Whitey Herzog is one of the finest men I ever met in baseball. Um, I often say to close friends that the day he was fired was the beginning of the end for me. Um, Whitey was a great, Whitey was great with young players. Uh, you don't hear a, a whole lot mentioned about Whitey before he came to the Rangers or really before he, took off, you know, when he got with the Royals and the Cardinals. But what a lot of people don't understand about Whitey, Whitey built the 1969 New York Mets team. He was he was head of player development with the Mets before he uh, got the job with the Rangers. So he was responsible for the drafting of Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, uh, mm. Gentry, uh, all those guys, and, and putting that ball, you know, putting that the young nucleus of that ball club together. Uh, that they, you know, went from worst to first. And I mean, the Miracle Mets of 69. Absolutely. Uh, so I felt very fortunate to be under Whitey at that time. He told me right off the bat when I joined the ball club that, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're, you've already pitched an awful lot. Because uh, at that point, I'd already had, I, I think I had 150 innings in high school at that point uh, from the season. Um, and wow. said, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to send you the instructional league this year. We'll, if we, if we want to start working on anything, we'll wait till next spring to do it. Uh, we're just going to let you go out and do your thing. And so then Whitey was fired, uh, in September of that year. And like I said, I, in a lot of ways, I felt like that was the beginning of the end right there. Right. Well, unfortunately I hear you had a rough relationship with Billy Martin. Um, 
Why do you think that was? Was he just hard to play for? You know, I really don't know. Um, I don't know what Billy had against me. Uh, whether he wanted me there or not, all I really wanted to do was pitch. Um, he, I got caught up in a power play between Billy and the front office. Um, Billy did not want me there. Uh, didn't feel like I could pitch at that time, which is his opinion. I mean, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I paid the price for it. Right. Uh, Billy wanted to be the star of the show. And right. that's fine. Like I said, I did not ask to be the center of attention. I just wanted right. to play in the leagues, but very virtue right. of everything that happened. Like I said, a perfect storm coming together. I went to high school here in Houston, playing in Dallas. You know, Texans support other, not that I'm a native Texan, but having gone to high school in Houston, I was considered a Texan and Texans Absolutely. support Texans. And yes. so uh, it all came together in a perfect storm that became kind of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but right. I am very grateful for the opportunities I was presented. I mean, I got a chance. Sure. And yep. There's a whole lot of guys that never get that chance. Absolutely. I know you've been asked this before. I know you've had time to think about it, but you retired with less than a month ago before you're eligible for your pension. Is that something that you just didn't think through or you just had enough and said, I'm out of here? I knew at the time that I retired that I was short the pension and, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of money back then. Uh, it's not like it is today. Um, so... I walked away on my terms. Uh, yeah. I was not, I was not, when I was with the Astros, I was not released by the Astros. I formally <laughs> retired from their organization. Right. Um, so I did know at that time. But one thing I am very, very proud of is over the last 20 years, I was part of a group. There, I wasn't the only one that was short the pension. There were, uh, at the time that baseball uh, and the players union came to an agreement in 81, I believe it was, to make it that you are vested in the MLB pension plan. Well, not the MLB, but the Major League Players Plan on day one. You are, in other words, the first day you're in the big leagues, you're you're vested in the pension plan. You're you, now you're not eligible for a check at that point, but you are eligible if you're fortunate enough to make enough money to buy the insurance after you retire. I mean, it's a great insurance plan, but it's, I'd hate to see what the price of it is. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, like I said, when I had my first child, it cost me about $3 to have that child while I was on, <laughs> while I was on the MLB pen, uh, uh, insurance program. Um, but there were about 1600 of us that were, that had served or played in the big leagues that were not eligible for pension under the new rules. And so, uh, over the years, nothing was being done. Uh, people were, you know, there was there were some attempts at, at getting it done, but nothing was happening. And then, uh, in I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but somewhere around 2009, 2010, I was asked to, to be on the committee uh, with the alumni association that was uh, fighting for this. Good. And uh, we did finally get something accomplished. Uh, 2011, I think it might have been somewhere right around there. So I am getting along with the other 500 or so guys that are still living. We've had 1,100 of us pass since then. Oh, wow. I am getting something from baseball, Good. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Also, now it's not what these guys are getting today, um, yeah, but still, but it is something. Now the problem with it is, it's not really a pension. So I'm not able to pass or none of the guys are able to pass on to either their spouse or their children what's there. It's more like an annuity. So when we pass away, it goes away. Right. The big thing is, as I'm sure the other 500 guys feel that I have fought for, uh, and I'm not the only one. There's three or four other uh, guys that really, uh, Eddie Robinson, who was uh, a, a very, who lived in Texas and a very famous baseball person, uh, was part of the group that helped get this accomplished. Um, 
So uh, we're very grateful for it, but we would like, you know, we'd like it to either be more like a pension. Uh, we fought, you know, the guys that I dealt with on this, we were the ones who made it what these guys have today. You know, we were the ones that were willing to step out and go on strike or, you know, or be locked out by the owners. Right. Uh, we laid the groundwork and it's kind of like, you know, we've been somewhat tossed aside. Uh, like I said, grateful for what we have, uh, wouldn't turn it down. Uh, but I think that baseball and the players association, because this check does not come from the union. This check comes from the competitive balance tax that the owners pay if they exceed the, the payroll threshold. And so I just, you know, I feel there could be more done. I've been very, very fortunate and blessed throughout my entire life that even after baseball, I, I, I had, uh, I was able to make a very, very good living. Uh, I still, for the most part, have my health today um, yeah. and, and all those things. So I am very, very grateful, uh, but there's nothing wrong with wanting it to be better. I mean, sure. we, went, we went 30, we went basically 30 years without. Um, and, and in that respect, uh, we, I think the, that the 500 or so that are still alive should be treated with a little bit more respect. I mean, we're, we've been told all along that the current player knows about our situation. Uh, but yet anytime I've talked to a current player, they're appalled that we don't have a pension. Right. They, they really don't, they haven't really, either they're not being paid, either they're not paying attention when they're being talked to in the spring, when the union goes around to all the teams and talks to the players, or they're not being told at all. Well, you should be proud of your efforts. Well, thank you. I am proud of that, especially, like I said, I've been very blessed in my life. There's a lot of guys out there that needed it a whole lot more than I do. I'm sure. If you could go back in time, What's one thing you would change or maybe do differently? Anything come to mind? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Uh, well, it won't take long. I mean, I, <laughs> I, do want, I don't want to think people think I'm crawfishing or anything by my next comments because I am you, very grateful for the opportunity the Rangers I, gave me. I know you are. But I would tell the Texas Rangers not to draft me. Oh, really? Absolutely. And the reason for that has nothing to do with what occurred with everything that went on with my life at that time. It has to do, if you look at the history of the Texas Rangers and the pitchers they have developed, oh. up until Nolan Ryan was in the front office, the Rangers really had not developed any pitching from within their own organization. I know. Now, they had guys go elsewhere and perform. You know, oh, they Tommy did. They... went to Atlanta and had a decent career. Lenny Barker was traded to Cleveland through a perfect game. I mean, the amount of arms that the Rangers had in their organization. I mean, I played on a team at Sacramento that had five guys throwing ninety plus back when ninety was a big number. Right. Uh, I mean, and yet very few of those guys ever made it to the big leagues with the Rangers. I mean. I don't know how it was with the other organizations uh, at that time, but I never received any instruction. Right. Never. Now, I will clarify that a little bit in that there's not a whole lot of instruction even to this very day, given at the major league level. You know, it's like major leagues, you know, you've earned, you, you've gotten here. You obviously are good enough to be here. For the most part, coaches are there to keep you on that path or, or, you know, to make sure if you start to stray from whatever your fundamentals were that got you there, they try to bring you back to the middle of it. But I never, you know, I never received any instruction on pitching theory. Um, I never had, you know, I never had a pitcher, an, a, a, another pitcher on my team take me under their arm and, and talk to me about things. Wow. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've read books about guys' careers and stuff, and there's always been somebody there to mentor them. Right. Uh, but I didn't have that. And I don't know why, for whatever reason, I didn't have that. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if it was because I didn't ask, you know, uh, but I didn't. 
I guess in that respect, you know, 18, 19 years old, asking somebody 30, 31, 32 years old, hey, you know, it was all done by baptism for the most part. I mean, right. when, I was yeah. struggling, when I was struggling in 1974, the only instruction I got, and this is God's honest truth, uh, pardon my language, but pitching coach at the time told me, I'll kiss your ass if you throw it over home plate and they hit it. And oh, that, man. That's you know, terrible. There was, there was nothing about, you know, try this, try that. You know, it was just. That's amazing. I can remember, I mean, to show you a little bit how naive I was. Um, yes, I was very, very dominant in high school. I mean, I wasn't afraid to brush guys back off the plate, but not to the extent that you brush a major league hitter back. Um, first time I was asked to knock a guy down, I didn't have any idea on how to knock a guy down. I mean, <laughs> I tried to throw a pit, and this was in 74, I tried to knock a guy down and threw strike one. <laughs> 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 the very next pitch i was asked to knock him down again and didn't come close to him i mean ball was it was high enough to knock him down but it was over the middle of the plate <laughs> Needless <laughs> to say billy was not happy about that so i got i got an earful for that but i'd never been instructed on how to do that the first right. time i ever walked an in a guy intentionally uh, i think that might have been in 73 i was terrified i mean <laughs> I'd never thrown a pitch out before in my life. I mean, right. uh, you know, I saw these guys on TV. I thought walking a guy intentionally was a piece of cake. So I just, first one I kind of lobbed up there, almost threw over the catcher's head. He came running out and said, just throw the ball. <laughs> he says, throw it. Don't lob it up here. Throw it and I'll catch it. I'll knock it down. <laughs> so, oh, man. Uh, I mean, just, just those little bitty things that you, you kind of think you take for granted that. Right. Not you really know, yeah. When you're, you know, when you're asked to do it. Absolutely. After you retired, did you consider going into maybe broadcasting or coaching or anything like that? Not really. I was pretty jaded about the game mm -hmm. um, in that. Uh, You're ready I to leave. Think, you know, even though I knew it was a business side of it, uh, I still looked at the game in a pure way. Um, so I was very jaded about it. Uh, uh -huh. The true love of the game, I feel, is really shown at the double-A level and down in baseball. Um, what happens in trip – most unhappy baseball players in the entire game are playing triple-A baseball. You've got, the young, you've got a lot of young guys there that feel like they're good enough to be in the big, big leagues, and you've got a lot of old guys that are on their way out that feel they still belong in the big leagues. Uh, so you got, there's not a lot of happiness there. The, some of the most joy I had playing the game was at the double A level, both with the Rangers and in the Astros organization. Cause, and that's where I met Stan Huff. I mean, we had fun. I mean, you know, I bet. you weren't making a lot of money. You, you bonded with players. You became lifelong friends. I mean, you rode buses. So you spent, you know, you spent a lot of time together and, and I mean, you didn't go in a hundred different directions when you hit a town, you know, cause you have friends here and friends there. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just a, you know, uh, like I said, when I walk, I, I mean, I walked completely away from the game. Um, I, I didn't even coach at the youth level at that time. Uh, my oldest son uh, was living with his mother in, in Ohio and Arizona. Uh, and like I said, I, I just right. made the decision that I didn't want to play anymore. And maybe in a lot of respect, the reason I walked completely away from it the way I did was I didn't want to second guess myself. Right. Do you still coach at like select ball or do you give lessons or are you still involved? Cause the other I'm day still on the top I'm still involved. I gave up coaching about five years ago. Okay. Uh, um, I'm not, a, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I, I am. In the last couple of years, I'm not a big believer in select baseball. Yeah. I just, I think yeah. they're, especially from the pitching standpoint, they're overusing kids. Um, I understand it costs a lot of money for on a parent, for a child to play select baseball. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing anywhere from 2,500 up these days, uh, just for the summer season. Yeah. Uh, 
And I understand from a parent standpoint that when you pay that kind of money, you really don't want to see your son sit. But when these kids go play, the amount of games they play in such a short period of time, they don't have the amount of pitching they have they need for that to occur. You know, they're carrying 10 or 12 kids and going to try to play five games if they're fortunate enough on a Sunday on a Sunday. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just yeah, I mean, it's a lot and i really don't believe with these select coaches uh, that baseball usa when they set these pitch count rules i don't believe they intended for these pitch count rules to be used the way they're using you know they run it right up to the limit so they can pitch again in the next game they run it right up to the limit again so they can pitch maximum tomorrow um you know some of these some of these kids are being asked to do things at a young level when their growth plates are still wide open and open to possible lifelong injury right. uh, that we don't ask major leaguers to do right. fully grown men that they're, that are fully physically mature. I mean, whether they're mentally mature or not, I don't know, but, <laughs> but they're fully physically mature. Their growth plates are closed. So we don't, we don't necessarily risk lifelong injury out of an adult. I'm almost done with you. Hang in there. Not a problem. Looking back at your career, what's your fondest memory? Well, I probably have two. Okay. Uh, number one, my my debut. Right. I mean, you can't beat I that. I don't know how <laughs> much better that could be. Um, and then number two was in 1978, pitching in Yankee Stadium on the last weekend of the season. And that was the mm -hmm. year that Bucky Dent, well, Bucky Dent hit the home run in the playoff game in Boston to put the Yankees in the world series. Uh, I drew the Friday and the Yankees. I, I always had the Yankees number. I mean, they traditionally, they don't hit left-handers well. Uh, but you know, I've never been a Yankee fan, although I should be, cause they're probably one of the <laughs> only ball clubs I have a winning record against. Uh, but, uh, I drew the Friday night starting assignment and went into the eighth inning winning either one to nothing, two to nothing. Uh, and had you know the place was packed. The Yankees had to win. Yeah. Every, they had to win. They had to win out just to have a chance. Right. And, and to have sixty thousand, close to sixty thousand people just silent, especially in New York. <laughs> um, Good luck with that. Silent. And but I gave up a leadoff base hit in the eighth, and uh, Jeff came and took me out, and the relief pitcher came in and didn't hold him. So I didn't. Yeah. I got a no decision, but we didn't win the ball game either. Right. You've had a lot of highs and lows in your career, but if you had to do it over again, would you do it? Yes. Okay. I would. Absolutely. Fair. I Good mean, deal. even though I don't like the direction the game is going in today, I'm still a purist. Sure. Uh, I would, I had the chance. I still love baseball. I work with young men almost every day. Uh, it keeps me active and, uh, you know, I've been blessed by the ability to have these things. Absolutely. Last question I have for you. What's one piece of advice that you can give somebody as the youth uh, ball player? In what way? Just any, any kind of advice, uh, work hard or play okay. select, don't play select, you know, okay. Well, anything. Uh, I didn't know if, you know, if we were talking about maybe a kid who was looking at being drafted or not, but the biggest thing I that I try to tell all kids, anytime you get a chance to come to work or, or come to practice, come with a purpose, come, come to try to get better. Don't just come in here and go through the motions. I do want you to have fun because baseball is supposed to be fun. Sure. But, you know, Every opportunity you get a chance to practice your craft, it's an opportunity for you to get better. Mm -hmm. And you always want to give 100% in practice so that you are in the habit of always giving 100% in a game. And the, the other thing is, is you never know who's watching you. You never know who might be just driving down the street and because he sees a team out there practicing, might just stop by just to see you. You know, it could be a pro scout, could be a college recruiter. I right. mean, could be just anybody that has a contact with someone. Right. Uh, and you always want to look like a ball player. 
I mean, the biggest thing you can, one of the biggest things you can do to your detriment is look sloppy. I mean, I've always taught, we've always taught the kids when you come to the ballpark, when you get out of the car, you're dressed. You're not coming like a ball player. You're not coming up with your shirt untucked or anything. I don't expect you to have your spikes on because you're walking on concrete, but I do expect you to look like a ball player. Yeah. Um, Because even though it's wrong uh, to judge a book by its cover, it happens and it happens all the time. And if you come up overweight, dressed sloppily, looking like somebody just off whatever, um, scouts are going to wonder, this is the guy I came to see. Right. Um, Yeah. You're going to have to do something extra special to turn his attitude around. On the other hand, if you come up looking very, for lack of better words, prim and proper, um, and you've taken care of your body and you look like the next coming of the Greek God, coaches and scouts are at least going to notice you and they're going to say, I want to see what he can do. And if you can get their attention that way, you've got half the battle because sure. they're looking at you. Yeah. And, you, and maybe you don't have to do something super special today. You just have to do it the right way. Yeah. And so, you know, I know, basically, you know, and the other thing is, is don't copy the big leaguers. They're doing, they're, you know, those guys are so talented and they know how to do it the right way. And, and just because it looks really cool at times to make that off that Derek Jeter throw going into the left field corner, going away to, towards first base, he only does that, or he only did that when he had to, if you can see him make the routine play, he did it just like we're trying to teach you young man. I mean, he comes up, fields the ball, takes that little step and throws it and follows it. I mean, right. he's not always out there trying to look like a, a ESPN highlight. I mean, but he's got the ability to do that when he has to. Sure. The last thing we do is our fun, fast five. You may not be familiar with it. It's just five fun questions we ask you. Sure. No right or wrong. No right or wrong answer. It's your opinion. Okay. You, you ready to play? I got All lots right. of opinions. <laughs> Good. Well, these are simple. Okay. What was what was one of your favorite TV shows growing up? Star Trek. Star Trek. Well, okay. Well, let me let me clarify that. Leave it to Beaver. Can't be Leave it to Beaver. I love Leave it to Beaver. It's on every morning here in Houston on on one of the digital channels, not not over the air at 7 o'clock every morning. I think it's great. (laughs) I still watch it myself. Yep. What's your favorite meal to have? Oh, steak by far. Okay. Fair enough. I agree with you. Do you have any hobbies? A good good steak, not a cheap steak. A good steak. Got to be a good good steak. Do you have any hobbies such as golfing or hunting or anything like that? I used to hunt quite a bit. Uh, I, I used to play golf quite a bit. I've had some physical ailments in the last few years that's kept me from uh, from playing golf. I, I, I haven't been fishing much lately, but I enjoy that. Uh, anything okay. out, of course. Yeah. Okay. Number four, what kind of music do you enjoy listening to? Oh, by far rock and roll. I mean, okay. <laughs> I mean, and Pink Floyd's my favorite. So, Pink, not if I need bad. To, if I need to really relax, I'll either I'll put on some classic Pink Pink Floyd and just lay back. Hello. I'm with you, my friend. Yep. You can't you can't beat that. And last, who was your favorite player growing up? Oh, there's no doubt in that one, Sandy Koufax. Sandy Koufax. Okay. Sandy Koufax. I got a. Uh, that's another one of my big moments. I, I received a telegram from Sandy about 30 minutes before I went out to warm up for my first game. Wow. And I fit, and at that time, I mean, I have a very analytical type mind. Uh, at that time I thought, well, who's playing a prank on me? I said, you know, Sandy's a recluse. He hadn't been heard from in, in how, no doubt to tell in how long, but he, I also knew he lived in Maine at the time. So when I got that Western Union telegram, I immediately went to where's it coming from? And it came from Maine. So, and then wow. on my 30th anniversary, I received a signed letter from him uh, on his stationery. So, yeah. and if you, I mean, people who watch baseball and they still look at him today, I still think Sandy could pitch today. <laughs> he's just a, he's just a very fine looking stately gentleman 
Well, thank you again for taking time to be with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Tony. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I've, it's been an honor to have you on. It's been an honor to meet you and hear your great stories. If I were you, I would be a little bit bitter. You don't seem to be bitter at all. You're very grateful for the things that you've had and have. Um, you're just a class act. That's all there is to it. Well, you know, a lot of people think the golden rule is to do unto others as they do unto you. But the real golden rule that God asks us to do is to forgive. Mm -hmm. And I have no bitterness. I've I've gotten past that. I've forgiven the people that I felt had it, you know. I mean, they may not know it, but I have forgiven them in my heart. And, uh, you know, I, I had those chances. Like I said, there's millions of young men out there that haven't had those chances. There's millions of people that are in sports that haven't had the opportunities that I've had off the field also. So I'm very Good. thankful to the Lord for everything he's done for me. Absolutely. You're a hall of famer in my book. Well, I appreciate <laughs> it, Tony and you as well. And as always, we appreciate you watching the, our show, um, hit that subscribe button and like button and tell a friend about it. But until next time, peace out. Thank you very much. Yes, sir.